looking at encounters with Jesus, and we get to an encounter uh, with two grieving sisters this morning called Martha and Mary. Um, we're going to be looking at the famous story of the raising of Lazarus. I should have given a bit of a spoiler alert there, shouldn't I? Should know, it's kind of given the whole story away of where it's going. Um, I'm assuming you probably knew anyway. Um, but our focus is going to be more on how Jesus interacts with Martha and Mary uh, than what happens with Lazarus. Although we will look at that because you can't really look at a passage like this and not touch on it, can you? Um, I want you to imagine for a minute, like some of your closest friends you think about some of the closest friends in your life, when I think about some of the closest friends that we have in our life, um, some of those friends would be kind of so closely involved in our family that our boys would think of them like aunties and uncles, even to the extent that they genuinely get confused about it. I mean, that's maybe partly they don't really know what it makes, <laughs> why you're an auntie and uncle or not. Um, but I'm trying to explain that to them, they still don't really get it, but never mind. Um, but, um, that it's just really lovely and a real privilege to have friends who have that kind of depth of friendship where they're thought of really in quite a literal sense of being part of your family. And it's like the kind of friends, I guess, where you might not see them for a long time, but immediately you can pick up that kind of level and depth of friendship a little bit like you can with family. You might not live where they are, but when you're back together, you're, you're family again. Um, and for Martha and Mary and their brother Lazarus, to understand today's passage, one of the things you really need to grasp is they were really close. Like, pretty much everyone agrees that outside of the 12 disciples, these were probably the people Jesus was closest to. They were like family. Like, some commentators suggest the best way to imagine it, or perhaps even they themselves thought of themselves a little bit like family together. So I am going to read... Um, some of the scriptures directly from the Bible, but it's, it's quite a long section that I wanted to look at today. So some of the story I'm just going to share with you, uh, and then when we drill down into it, I will put some of the verses up on the screen and look into them in a bit more detail. So Lazarus has fallen very sick. He lived in a little village called Bethany, uh, along with his two sisters, Martha and Mary. Uh, Martha and Mary probably lived in a different house for Lazarus, um, because the very fact that the Bible often talks about Martha hosting and the way that's talked about shows that she was probably the head of her household. Lazarus might have been married, we're not sure, but he had his own household as well. And Mary, by the way, she's the same Mary who later goes on to anoint Jesus with perfume. Um, although they don't get too confused about that because there's multiple anointings of Jesus, so don't get too confused in your head if you're thinking, oh, really? Um, <laughs> and we won't get lost in that now. So anyway, they send a message to Jesus saying the one you love is sick. So even there, there's a hint about how deeply Jesus felt about Lazarus and Martha and Mary. He loved them deeply, and the passage actually tells us that explicitly. So they send this message to Jesus, and when Jesus first heard it, here's the message. He says to his disciples, oh, the sickness won't end in death, which is a little pointer to where it's all heading. Um, and also, Jesus makes a slightly crazy decision, and he immediately decides to stay exactly where he is two days longer. So he's just heard his friends were ill, and he just stays where he is. And then after two days, he's like, let's go to Judea. Now, Judea was like the wider area that Bethany was in. Bethany's about two miles from Jerusalem, and there would have been a lot of back and forth between Bethany and Jerusalem. And his disciples are like, uh, really? Like, last time you went there, they tried to stone you. Do you think that's like a good idea to go back there? And they're a little bit hesitant, understandably. Um, so after two days, um, they do do it anyway. They go through with it. And as they're thinking about all this, he confuses his disciples somewhat. Because he tells the disciples, oh, Lazarus has fallen asleep. And so his disciples are like, okay, he's asleep, that's good, right? Like, sleep's good, we're getting better. Like, he'll recover, he'll be fine. And he's like, no, 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 no. Like, I'm just trying to politely tell you he's now dead. Um, and it's not like another messenger has come to them. It seems that God has just revealed that to Jesus via the Holy Spirit. So Thomas, being the ever optimistic, never doubting one of the disciples, I am being sarcastic. Um, anyway, Thomas, um, he's like behind Jesus' back to the other disciples. Well, I guess we better go with them, but you know, we are going to die. But, well, I guess we're going to do it, but we're, we're going to die while we're there. So Thomas, like very optimistic, approach to it all. And then by the time they eventually arrive in Bethany, 
uh, Lazarus had been in the tomb four days. So they did tend to do these things quite quickly back then, but he's presumably been dead even longer than four days. And many of the fellow Jews were there, kind of comforting Martha and her sister, so presumably the wider family and friends had all come along uh, to bring comfort. And when Martha hears that Jesus is coming, she immediately goes out to meet him, uh, but Mary, for whatever reason, chooses to stay in the house. And Martha says, Lord, if you'd been here, he wouldn't have died. And then later it goes on, when Jesus is speaking to Mary, she then basically says the same thing. So pause the story there for a moment. And the um, first point I want to make is Jesus is always perfectly on time. Perfectly on time. So John eleven six. When he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. So from a design perspective, and often perhaps for us as well, with hindsight, Jesus is always perfectly on time. However, that's often a long, long time after we have liked him to show up. Isn't that our experience in life so often? Certainly here for Martha and Mary, they're both pretty clear with Jesus that if you'd been here, he wouldn't have died. They're pretty clear about how they're feeling. They're effectively blaming Jesus and saying, if you'd been here, they've seen him do all kinds of healings. So their expectation was if Jesus had been there in that moment, he wouldn't have passed on. And I've got to be honest, like you think of it from Martha's and Mary's point of view, wouldn't we all have been irritated as well if we were in that situation? Like you heard your friend who you love so much is sick, and you decide to intentionally wait longer before coming. And um, of course, with hindsight, it's kind of obvious to see what's going on. Jesus knew all along that he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. He made that clear because the first thing he said to the disciples is that it wouldn't lead to death. And he knew that, as well, he needed to wait a bit longer if people weren't going to question whether he'd actually been raised from the dead or not. It was like, I need to be sure in this instant that people aren't like, oh, he's just made a remarkable recovery. Like, people thought he died, but he hadn't actually died. So Jesus seems to have intentionally delayed to make it really clear with this miracle that he's going on to perform that it actually was a dead man raising back to life. So bringing this more into that everyday luck realm about the idea that Jesus is always perfectly on time, when you think about the way we pray, the way we reach out to Jesus, we must learn how to face and handle delays in answer prayer. And also learn how to handle, uh, perhaps even more challengingly, prayers which never get answered, unanswered prayer. Or certainly, there might be another way of looking at that, prayers that don't get answered the way we want them to be. And we had a friend called uh, Harry, he did a gap here in our previous church. He was really good actually, did an amazing job of serving the church. He did it, just finished university and gave a year uh, working the church, doing all kinds of things. And pretty much throughout that whole year, he'd spent most, a lot of time applying for jobs, looking ahead for the next year as he kind of launched his career as a new graduate. And he spent loads and loads of time looking for jobs. And we were praying for him loads about it throughout the year. And he got right to the end of the year, to cut a long story short, and he still hadn't got a job. He'd had a few interviews, uh, but hadn't really felt he got anywhere with them. And we got to the, the very final training weeks. Every now and again, we went off on these residential uh, training weeks. And this was going to be the final week of his course. And on literally the final day of his, uh, his course year, he was, it was actually... I think this is right. He was actually leading worship in one of his uh, kind of all the rest of his court people doing the course with him. And he gets a phone call, and you guessed it, it was someone offering him a job. So, like, right at the very, very final minutes um, of his uh, kind of year, he got offered the job that he'd been praying for for pretty much the entirety of that year. Because Jesus is always perfectly on time, but often far later than we wanted to show up. Because for Harry, it would be much more convenient if he'd known about that like six months ago. 
So he could have been George's view about the worry, about the anxiety, constantly, what on earth am I going to do? He was facing things like potentially having to move back home to his parents, to have enough money to live, but God wants them to be in Oxford. So there's all those kind of dilemmas, because Jesus is always perfectly on time, but it's often ages after we want him to show up. Harry actually, I think, handled that waiting pretty well, but I know in my life there's certainly been times when I've handled delays really poorly. Delays in answering uh, God's seemingly answering prayer. And there have been other times as well where I found it really difficult where we pray for things and it seems certainly now at this point it's probably never going to be a prayer that gets answered in the way that I want it to be. I think it's worth acknowledging there is like a whole load of mystery around unanswered prayer. Um, particularly perhaps in situations where it's kind of become pretty clear there'll never be an answer. Like where we prayed for a loved one and they're now no longer with us. Like there's, I, I know we're reading a story here where Lazarus raises from the dead, but there comes a point, doesn't there, where it's pretty clear there isn't going to be an answer to that one in this life. And while I think that like some unanswered prayer has quite simple explanations, like some unanswered prayer is just because what we're asking for is a bit stupid and God's really kind to us not to answer. Um, and then there's the kind of the classic thing of like, well, if I'm praying for it to, uh, to be a really nice hot sunny day so I want to enjoy my weekend and the farmer's praying for rain in the crops, God can't answer both of those prayers. So some answer, unanswered prayers are explained away quite simply, but then there does remain kind of great mystery around some uh, prayers that we might pray. I think Perhaps the classic and most challenging example that we'll all face at times in life is when we're praying for a friend or a family member who we love dearly, uh, who's unwell in some way. Like that's often the most challenging uh, kind of where this really kind of hits the rubber hits the road kind of moments around prayer. So there is mystery why God doesn't answer some prayers. Writer Philip Yancey makes this really helpful comment on this tension. So if prayer stands as the place where God and human beings meet, then I must learn about prayer. Most of my struggles in the Christian life circle around the same two themes. Why doesn't God act the way we want him to? And why don't I act in the way God wants me to? Prayer is the precise point where those two themes converge. So why doesn't God act the way we want him to? And why don't I act the way God wants me to. Really challenging, really, really helpful. And I, I think as well, it's worth bearing in mind that when we talk about prayer here, we're not thinking about prayer as just us making our requests to God. It's a two-way conversation. And that's why for these two things, this is the precise point, prayer is the precise point that these two themes converge. Because God speaks to us and we can speak to him. It's not a one-way conversation. So what then does Martha and Mary's encounter teach us about how our unanswered prayers or prayers that seem to be delayed in being answered? Well, I think there's a few things about kind of God's delays in particular which come out really helpfully here. First of all, they will happen. So obvious point, but I think an important one, um, like God's delays will happen. It, it helps to be mature enough in our faith to accept they are part of how God works. To accept that when we're experiencing delays, um, it is just part of the reality. For a start, we're not omniscient like God is. So we don't always see the bigger picture of what is going on with God sees. So we can't claim to fully understand the situation enough to fully grasp why God might not have answered in that situation. Secondly, it shows that he loves us. So John 11, 5 to 6 says, Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. So it says, Jesus loved Martha and her sister Lazarus. So, so you could read it. So um, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister Lazarus. So because of that, because he loved them, he stayed where he was two more days. That's essentially what the text says. So it's literally saying that because he loves them, he stayed there two more days. So Jesus delays sometimes out of his love for us. And Jesus loves mature love, not an immature love. So what he, his heart for us is far more about our eternal holiness than our temporary happiness. 
He cares far more about our eternal holiness than our temporary happiness. And actually, our ultimate happiness comes with the eternal happiness, but let's not get too lost in that, in that thought for the moment. But God loves us enough that he wants us to grow and mature as well would be the third thing about God's place. So learning how to handle unanswered prayer and moments where we feel disappointed with God are absolutely vital things to learn. And at those moments when we don't handle disappointment well, that can lead to bitterness and to cynicism particularly. And I'll tell you what, they're two great killers of faith. In the story we've got today, I would say I've seen lots of people walk away from faith for far smaller reasons than this. Because they've let disappointment grow, perhaps even about something that to everyone else seems quite trivial and we can't really understand, looking in, how that's grown to something that leads to them literally walking away from Jesus. It's because once disappointment takes root, it can grow into a bitterness, it can grow into a cynicism. And although it might often outwardly be talked about about other things or directed at other people, often ultimately it's being directed towards God himself. If we get stuck in that place of only you have done this, God, if only you've done what I wanted, and when you begin to express it like that and see how immature it sounds, we wouldn't be in this mess. That's dangerous territory to be in. So a challenging question for all of us is, are you harboring any disappointment in your life at the moment? Maybe you are, and you're like, it's okay because it's nothing to do with God. Just be a little bit careful that actually that disappointment isn't really directed at God. You're just kind of covering it up even in the way that you process it. You know what? I think when you initially get those kind of disappointments, those challenges, there's nothing wrong with that. That's the normal part of life. I'm not saying you're doing something wrong to have experienced the disappointment. That's very, very normal. The challenge is what you do with that, where you take that, and it's the potential damaging emotions that come from that that can end up totally derailing your life in God and everything else as well as a result. So, don't let it grow. My personal experience and my experience of pastoring other people would say that the quicker you deal with it, the better. The more that it grows, the more likely it is to take root and grow. And yes, it's something that I want to encourage us to bring to Jesus this morning, and we'll do that in the end, uh, the end of the meeting when we respond. But also, it's worth recognising that if stuff has really grown and taken root there, there might be stuff where you know, like, oh yeah, there is a little bit of disappointment there, and you can kind of literally just deal with that this morning. But there might be stuff that's taken root in your life there that actually is going to take a real process to deal with and work for you. It's going to take time with you sitting down with God. Perhaps in my life that would look like getting a journal out, trying to write down and express why I actually think and feel about something that's happened. It can take time and probably will need help and advice and input from friends as well. Don't let it grow though. Hand it over to God. To be honest with God about how you're feeling. It's okay to be honest about the disappointment. It's okay to be honest about you're struggling with being honest with God about, like, oh God, I don't know why you didn't do that. It's much better to get really honest with God and deal with it and root it out as soon as possible. So in the story, Jesus could have mapped out his whole strategy in advance for the sisters. He could have been like, it's okay. I know where this is going. Like, he is going to be raised and that. He could have told them in advance. But because he loves them, he didn't. Because he loves them, he didn't. Because he knew that they had to learn how to trust him. That they had to grow. That they had to mature and work out how to handle the delays of God. Because the truth is, it's where real faith muscle grows. If you really want to grow that faith that's talked about that moves the mountains... It doesn't come in the easy moments, it comes in the challenging moments. It comes through walking and processing pain. It comes through learning how to handle the realities of life, that we don't always get what we want. But God isn't the genie in the bottle that if you say the right combination of things, it happens exactly as we want it. It's just not how it works. It's not the kind of faith that God is trying to draw out of us. It's not the kind of holiness that God is ultimately trying to draw out of us. 
Linked to that, the next point is Jesus is always what we need. Always what we need. So picking up the story again, when Martha hears that Jesus is coming, she immediately runs out to meet him, but Mary stays at home. And Martha says to the Lord, I'm going to read from the text this time, so I want to make a bit of a point about this. Uh, so John 11, 21. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection of the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me, he will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who's coming into the world. And then having spoken like this with Martha, Martha then goes and gets her sister Mary, and actually all of the Jews who are there helping Mary and Martha born decide to go with her as well. So then there's a whole crowd around Jesus when we get to the next point. And so Mary comes to Jesus, and it says this, when Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you've been here, my brother would not have died. Notice how it's almost exactly the same thing that Martha said to Jesus when they first met. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. The shortest verse in the whole Bible, two words that show us that Jesus experiences the same emotions that we do. Do you notice anything about the contrast of these two uh, verses? I think you just flip on to the next one. There's, yeah, there we go. You can see the, the heart of the two responses next to each other. So Martha and Mary say the same thing, but totally different response from each of them. So when Martha speaks, she's basically telling him he's too late, and Jesus' response is quite strong. He basically pushes back, in love of course, because we know that he really loves her, He's trying to lift Martha back into a place of faith. He's trying to bring her out of a place of hope, uh, bring her into a place of hope out of despair. But when it comes to Mary, he barely says anything. He's pretty much speechless. He just joins Mary in her grief and starts weeping with her. So when Jesus responds to Martha, he tells her that he's the resurrection and the life, that he has power over death and life itself, and he's reminding her, and reminding all of us as we look at it, that he's divine, that he's fully God. But then when we get to Mary, we see something completely different. He breaks down sobbing in the weight of the grief. And you wouldn't think, really, that God would be so exposed, so vulnerable. Because Jesus was fully God, but he was also fully human. So we see there, in, in the fully human side of him, he is one of us. He feels the horrific power of death and grief. Feels the love and the pain of lo losing someone that you love. So what we have in Jesus is incredibly hard to grasp. He's not part God, part human. He's fully God, fully human. 100% God, 100% human. And yes, the maths doesn't add up. But of course it doesn't because he's Jesus. And there's a powerful truth around the 100% God, 100% human thing about how our salvation works. We don't have fully on time to unwrap today, but we will come back to the resurrection and life bit towards the end. But it means in the here and now, as we seek to live for Jesus, he is always, always what we need. And Tim Keller, uh, writer, theologian, former church leader Tim Keller, as always, puts things so much better. I spent like ages trying to say something like what Tim says in my short paragraph. So you, you could be grateful, Tim, because this talk would be an extra hour if we hadn't had this little quiet. So he says, But Jesus Christ is never strong when he should be tender, or tender when he should be strong. Yet it isn't just that he is perfect, wonderful counselor, he is the truth itself come in tears, he is the deity incarnate in the flesh. It's this paradox that he's both God and human that gives Jesus an overwhelming beauty. He is the lion and the lamb, and
And despite his high claims, he is never pompous. You never see him standing on his own dignity. Despite being absolutely approachable to the weakest and the broken, he is completely fearless before the corrupt and the powerful. So Jesus is never strong when he should be tender, and never tender when he should be strong. He is always what we need. Any situation we ever find ourselves in, he is always the right answer. There is never a better place to go to look for answers than Jesus himself. We'll come back to that as well when we respond at the end. But picking up the story again. So when Jesus sees Mary and all the other Jews and all the emotion, he joins in the weeping. But not only did he feel the pain of the sisters, his spirit was outraged. He was angry. Now, yes, your Bible probably says something like he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Um, it's not like a wrong translation, but pretty much every commentator you can find, in fact, I literally couldn't find one who didn't make this point, um, says that it's a polite and somewhat light way of putting it. What it means, essentially, is he was angry in the spirit. It says that he bellowed with anger, as the way one interprets it, trying to make a really accurate translation from the Greek. He was outraged. Angry with what? Well, he wasn't angry with the family. He clearly deeply loved them. There's no hint that he was in any way angry with Martha or Mary or Lazarus. So what was he actually angry at? And incidentally, he's, he's not angry at you either. We don't have time to fully unpack that theology now, but Jesus deals with that on the cross. So if you come to Jesus, Jesus is not angry with you. He loves you deeply. It's in fact impossible for him to be angry with you because that's all we dealt with in Jesus. So Jesus is raging with anger, and he's raging with anger at death itself and the one who stands behind it, the enemy, the devil. He is raging with anger at death and the devil. Jesus is looking at the one of the things that, like, worst things we can ever experience in terms of the loss of a loved one, and he looks at it and he's fuming, he's outraged, he's utterly incensed at the evil and suffering. Anger in and of itself, we should know as well, is not wrong, and Jesus' anger is certainly not wrong. And when anger is against evil, it can be used for incredible good. So he asks, Jesus asks where the tomb is, they take him to the tomb, the crowd of Jews start to murmur amongst themselves, they comment about how much you love Lazarus, which is like, I guess, a good comment, but they also cynically start to say, well, couldn't he have stopped him dying? If he could open the eyes of the blind, why couldn't he have stopped Lazarus dying as well? And when he gets to the tomb, and it says again that Jesus' spirit is outraged. He's angry as he stands there before the tomb. He stands there shaking with anger at death itself. Not just Lazarus' death, but he knows what is coming. He knows where it's going. He knows that he's going to take on death itself when he goes to the cross. He knows that he's going to do battle with Satan, sin, and death. And he knows that to take on that battle, he's going to have to give his very life. So he tells them to take the stone away that's laid across the entrance. Martha shows that she clearly hadn't understood before what Jesus was on about when he was trying to lift her from, uh, from despair to hope. Because the point she makes at that point is like, it's going to stink. He's been in there four days and he's been dead even longer. Do not remove that stone. It's absolutely going to stink. But Jesus is insistent and like, no, do it. And Jesus says, do you know I tell you? If you believed, you would see the glory of God. So they do it and they take away the stone. Jesus looks up and prays to his father. I know you have heard me, but I'm saying this for the benefit of the people here that they might believe, and I guess for the benefit of us today as well. He then called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! And Lazarus came out, still wrapped up in the linen and the cloth over his face, um, as he had been prepared for burial. And then I haven't got this bit on the screen, but then Jesus kind of points out the obvious, and like, you probably should have unwrapped him, he's still kind of wearing the clothes, he's been buried in, I think probably because everyone else was too stunned to say anything, so he's like, go on, unwrap him then, like, what are you just standing there shocked for? Um, and it says that many of the Jews who saw this unfold then believed in him. So, so far we consider how Jesus is always perfectly on time, and he's always what we need, Finally here we see that he is our very life. 
John goes on, uh, just beyond the end of the verses that we've read up to, to say that this whole event is a sign. And through this series, we've actually seen a number of signs. And the sign in John's Gospel is something that points towards Jesus' identity as the Messiah, the one who saves, the one who's the Son of God. And also, every single time you see a sign, it leads to people believing in him and coming to faith. So this is the last and the ultimate sign in John's Gospel, because it anticipates very clearly Jesus' own death and resurrection. It doesn't take a genius to work out what this is pointing towards. And also, Jesus very, very clearly states what he's about. So John 11, 25, Jesus said to her, so he said to Martha in that initial conversation, I am the resurrection and life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me, he will never die. Do you believe this? I guess that's the same challenge for us today. Do you believe that? That Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And you know what? Resurrection life is not just about the future. It is about that. And it is referring to that. But he also says, I am the resurrection and life, implying that right here and now. The very life that beats death forever is available in Jesus right here and now. As one commentator put it really helpfully, to believe in Jesus means that death lies defeated. So for me to believe in Jesus means that death lies defeated over my life. For you to believe in Jesus means that death lies defeated over your life. Yes, there will be a moment of physical death. I'm not suggesting some kind of weird theology that you literally never die. If physical death, yes. Spiritual death, never. It will be the Bible's theology, basically. We will be with him one day in glory. And so we've covered a lot of ground today. Uh, we've seen how Jesus is always perfectly on time, although often ages after we want him to show up. It's always what we need, not necessarily what we want, but always what we need. And finally, he is our very life. So I'm just going to invite um, Ben and Joanna to come back up so we can sing again in a moment. Um, we weren't going to take communion together today, but a slight confession, the scale of arrival, but the communion stuff we've got is out of date. Um, so sorry about that. <laughs> uh, maybe you should have checked that first. Um, so we weren't going to put you through all the that for the sake of taking communion together. Um, we'll look at it again next week instead, maybe. Um, so as we land this, just want to challenge on two things really of do you have any disappointments that you need to hand over to Jesus today? Things maybe where you're frustrated that God's seemingly not answering. Things maybe where you know that God is now never going to answer in the way that you want. Maybe even stuff that you've not even prayed about, maybe you should have done but you haven't and you're annoyed with how it's worked out. You're annoyed with how you feel God's worked it out. There will be opportunity after we've sung for us to bring them to God. And also, just want to challenge us further and just remind us that Jesus is always what we need. He's never strong when he should be tender, and never tender when he should be strong. I can certainly remember times when I felt weak and broken in my life, like some of the lowest points in my life. I remember experiencing God's presence so powerfully, yet so tenderly. And there's other moments in my life where I know I've been being really rebellious and really stubborn. And I felt God really strongly challenge me and rebuke me. God is always perfectly what we need. Jesus always comes to us exactly as we need it in that moment. He knows us inside out because he's fully God. And he understands exactly what he's like, what it's like for us because he's fully human. He knows exactly what we need. He loves you just like he loved Lazarus and Martha and Mary. They were like family together. And you know what? We're more than like family together in Jesus now. He is our brother. He's brought us into his family. We are his family. He knows exactly what we need and he loves us so deeply. And in this story we see Lazarus raised. But in the story that's coming in the gospel, when Jesus himself is raised, he's being raised so that we might have new life, so that we might experience the resurrection life, because he is our very life. 
So let's sing this song together and then we'll speak a, a, a little chance to respond um, quite as we wrap up the meeting.